Professor Blair, thank you very much for talking to me today. My first question will be, why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I was asked to give a series of lectures in London in 2011, a biannual lecture series with four lectures in two weeks. So I knew I had to find a topic that would appeal to a lot of people and would appeal to them in case they didn't get to all four in a row, because we all know how busy people in everywhere are, but particularly in London. So I decided to focus it on four different events or four different topics so I could present Persian art as a case study. And I arranged them that way. I knew I could get wonderful pictures, so it would be um, something pretty to look at and something that would be available to both my audience there and then for the volume that gets published thereafter and for students who are my main audience. What major periods in Iranian history and geography do you cover in your book? My book goes from the beginning of Islam, the rise of Islam in Iran, which doesn't occur with the beginning of Islam in 622, but really only by the 10th century is most of the population Muslim, so we can say it is an Islamic country. And it goes up to what I would call the pre-modern period, which is about uh, the 1500s, after Columbus sails the ocean blue and Vasco da Gama goes round the world. We have a change, a major change in world politics, 1500. So I really deal with between 1,000 and 1,500. And I particularly um, like this period because it's one where Iran is really in the center of things. Why did you choose these five objects? And what special characteristics do they share? Well, I chose them basically because I had five centuries and I had, it was only four lectures originally, so I only had four objects, but when I published it, I was asked to add a fifth object. So I really have one per century, and what I wanted to show were the changes that took place over the centuries, when the focus of Iran really moved from east, what is Eastern Iran and Central Asia now, to Western Iran up near the Turkish border. So I had two from before the Mongol invasions and two from after the Mongol invasions. And I wanted to have one of each major kind of art or architecture that was produced in this period. So I have one building, one textile, one ceramic, and I added one painting, and there's also one piece of metalwork. So you really get a sense of all the different arts that were created in Iran in this period. And I wanted in each of them to take a well-known object and show how you can use an object to tell a story, a story that goes across time and through time. So you can talk about other works that were made at the same time and why this one was particularly good. You can talk about how it was collected. You can talk about how it was, is displayed today in different museums, and even how the politics of today affects the display that's going on right now. All of them share the fact that they are very, very good. All of them are well known. I wasn't discovering a new object. That wasn't the point. The point was, and I wanted to use it for students, to show how you can take something and use it to show many different things. And someone who reviewed the book said it was like casting a stone into a pool of water, and the ripples would come out larger and larger. And that's what I wanted to do. What distinguishes Persian art from other contemporary works? Persian art is very, very good. It is just technically superb. Persians have a long craft tradition. They know how to use their materials. They have access to superb materials. For instance, the metalwork that I analyzed was made in Herat, where they developed around the year 1200 a way of taking a single sheet of metal and, ca and hammering it into extraordinarily complicated objects just from this one single piece. I mean, one that is decorated with 24 ducks, all hammered out from the back in the repoussé technique, inlaid, and these are just everyday objects, but raised to an extraordinarily level of craftsmanship and beauty. In terms of manuscripts, I don't think anywhere in the world you could find finer illustrated manuscripts than the ones that are produced in Persia. In terms of the kinds of pigments, uh, the way they're applied, the quality of the compositions, and the integration of text and image. And that was the theme that ran through all of my objects and the theme that I'm particularly interested in, how word and image work together to tell a story. 
connection between visual and verbal art is one of increasing interest to the historians of medieval art. What are some of the common themes? Well, Islam, as you probably know, is a religion of the word. The central miracle of the faith is that God sent down his word in Arabic. So you could compare in the Muslim tradition the Quran to Christ in the Christian tradition in which God sent down his son. Hence, words become particularly important in the Islamic tradition. But on the other hand, Iran has had a very long tradition of figural imagery, going all the way back to the pre-Muslim period. So what I was really interested in is how they combined figures and writing, sometimes to say the same stories, sometimes to add a little different touch so that sometimes the picture was making a sort of commentary on the words. Sometimes they're saying the same thing, but sometimes they are reacting to each other. At sometimes the word is more important and we have only words decorating the ceramic that I chose. In other cases, figures are more important and I like to see how they go back and forth and play with both of them. What is the role of women in medieval Persian art? As you know, women tend to be underrepresented in written sources, which, as I tell my class, are written by dead white men. Um, most people who wrote down histories and chronicles were scholars, and that tended to be the male class. Sometimes, however, women get depicted in art, and we get a clue then about their lives. They were patrons of art. They sometimes commissioned calligraphy. We thought they none of them knew how to write. That's not true at all. And one of the manuscripts, or the manuscript I wrote on in this book, mostly has illustrations of women. And I think it was intended as a wedding present, because most of them are the wedding night, the parties before and after the wedding. And what's really interesting is that the people who collected this manuscript understood that, because I think even into the 20th century, it was bought as a wedding present for someone who, was, who had um, who needed to find a present for his wife. So I think we get a whole different view of the way women acted or reacted uh, that we wouldn't have if we simply depended upon the written text. And how did you get interested in Persian art? I belong to the hippie generation. And after I finished college and before I went to graduate school and was going to be go into social theory and work with Talcott Parsons on highly theoretical things at the University of Chicago, I put on my backpack with a friend, and we headed off for India. We'd both spent our junior year abroad, and we'd covered Europe. So we sort of flew uh, to Europe and then hitchhiked to Istanbul, and with everybody else who was going to India, started on the trail over land. But this is what everybody did back then. It wasn't something special. I got as far as Iran. We were both tired. We traveled for about three months. And after that, you start getting seed out. You can't see anything new because you've just seen so much new. So we both settled down. This was the days of the Shah, Ooh, and the one advantage was that it was quite safe for foreigners to be there. We got jobs teaching. I taught English in a high school. I taught English in a university. I taught sociology. I taught all sorts of things. And I fell in love with Iran. And when I came back after two and a half years, I decided no more social theory. I was going into Middle Eastern studies because I really liked the people I had met, and I just loved Iran. So I went into Islamic art and specializing in Iran. I wish that all my students now could travel because I think it's so important to see America from the outside in. It gives you a different perspective uh, to see how other people live. It's getting increasingly hard. I can't recommend that they go off and you know hitchhike to India now, but I think they should get a foreign experience.